My brother Cheeky would tell me, just so you know, there's people that want to take you away. Hey kid, what, you wanna know the truth? Yeah, you're kidnappable. So I knew that at a young age. This is batshit, right? This is no kind of childhood, yeah, yeah. like I what mean, you're I, talking now, now that I'm older and I'm a 45-year-old man with a family of himself, I'm fully aware of the evil of drug trafficking. Griselda Blanco, a flamboyant woman nicknamed La Madrina, or Godmother. A Colombian drug baroness. A cocaine queen pin of sorts. I would characterize her as the epitome of the cocaine cowboys. Más conocida como la reina de la cocaína. Griselda Blanco has been charged with three murders. Griselda Blanco. Griselda Blanco. Griselda Blanco. For the last 20 years, I've watched other people tell the story of my mother and our family. Now it's my turn to tell the real story. I'm Billy Corbin here with Michael Corleone Blanco, author of yes. My Mother, The Godmother, now available at MyMotherTheGodmother.com. Also repping Blanco Family Fincas and Packaging Company. Michael, shout out our other sponsor. And if you just happen to get into a jam in Northern California in the Bay Area, call Ace Deuce because Ace Deuce will bust you loose. I can't wait. Later on in the series, we'll talk about the Bay Area and yes. uh, some Charles Cosby Cocaine Cowboys 2 Hustle with the Godmother shit. Big shout out to the Bay Area and uh, the Blancos by the Bay. In the meantime, we're talking about episode two of Griselda, the Netflix miniseries starring Sofia Vergara. Fuck you and your little monkey. Neither of you are touching my coat. Okay, fuck that. This bitch can't come in here mouthing off like that. All right? Portraying a version of your mother. Uh, in this show, but but telling the story in in of of your family in a in a in a creative uh, <laughs> in a creative literary license uh, kind of way. Obviously, if you want if you want the real story, you'll read yes. uh, your book again. We're going to start off with what we liked about this particular episode because this episode got me in terms of historical accuracy. Your mother's story aside, this one this one confused me and 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 made me laugh in a lot of ways. So I'm curious though about things that you feel episode two of Griselda, rich white people is the name of the episode. This is part of the comedy here, but in terms of things that they got right, one of the things I liked about it was how prominent Pan Am was at Miami International oh, Airport. Yeah, I thought that true. was a cool yes, period accurate shout out. Pan um, Am and Eastern Airlines back in the day. Yeah, as well. one of the one of my pet peeves though, and this is not unique to Griselda. This is true of like a lot of the fake Miami shows. Nip Tuck, CSI Long Beach, a.k.a. CSI Miami, Dexter every season after the first season, because the first season was mostly shot down here. But when it's California as Miami in a show, that drives me nuts. Uh, the, the, the palm trees are totally different. The beaches are different. The, the architecture. Is, the, the architecture. Yeah, everything's totally completely different. different. Yeah, there's a little bit of Spanish architecture in some of the episodes that kind of could pass for Coral Gables. Yes. But for the most, and then there's like Maybe. one cool deco motel, I think, in, in a later whole episode. episode. Yeah. Is one similar deco to yeah. hotel to Miami yeah. style South Beach days, but the mutiny is like an office park. It doesn't really look like yeah. a place in the gro- in Coconut Grove. It's it, but again, that's not unique to this show. That's every show that has I to. Mean, shoot. Scarface did it as well. Remember, in Scarface they had to shoot most of it in Los Angeles as well. But they shot enough of it in Miami yes. that Scarface is that very is. much a Miami movie. This I don't think they shot a frame of this no. in Miami. This was Where all do Cali. You see? Hundred foot palm trees in Miami. Oh yeah, you know yeah. Los Angeles palm trees. Oh yeah, no, they're they're like ninety feet, ninety yeah. feet tall. Which even are, which the is hotels, like, is, hey, they did what they could. Oh, that the hotel in episode two, that motel, it looked like Daniel Larusso lived downstairs, like at the Karate Kid, like that architecture and like that that staircase and everything. I'm like, that is yeah. so uniquely Cali. But hang on, something that you and I talked about before that that they got rightish, or at least this is a character that was composited or inspired by real life characters, and that is Carmen the travel agent. Why don't you come work with me at the agency? You know, to help you get started, see how a business runs. Yes, it's inspired by the actual person that was the one that was responsible for basically co-signing a lot of the crimes that my mother was indicted for. She was a very intricate part in the family, my mother's close friend, and she survived an attempted murder, but not from my mother, from somebody else. So the real-life version of the Carmen character then Existed. was a little bit more involved, not just sort of yeah. a passive, innocent sort of person. Yeah, I speak about it in my book, My Mother, the Godmother. Amilcar, 
is a real person. Yes, um, from what I understand, 100%. Yeah. But the idea that he was, like, running Miami and your mom needed permission from him, that's no, not far accurate. from it. Okay. Did they ever interact, to your knowledge? Oh, uh, yeah. Del Venezolano, el chamo. But my mother, from the moment she stepped off the plane, within two weeks, she was already controlling most of the market here in Miami. Within a matter of months, she was already the number one distributor here in Miami. Remember, my mother was very um, loved, not only by Medellin cocaine czars, but her best friend was Santa Cruz from Cali, from the Cali cartel. So my mother wasn't only getting weight from Peru, Bolivia, and then later on, late 70s, 1980s, Medellin drug cartel, nucleus, but also from Cali cartel. So I think what you're getting at here is that it would not have been difficult for your mother to find a way to sell or unload 10 kilos of cocaine in Miami in 1979 <laughs> because no. the entire episode hinges on Griselda's inability. Like, she's panicking yeah, yeah. about, like, what am I going to do with 10 kilos of 99% pure cocaine in Miami in 1979? That was, that was lint in her pocket. <laughs> you understand? She was the first cocaine trafficker to sell 100 kilos. She was the first to ever put a one-ton... Uh, load and sh- and then became the number one cocaine distributor since the early 70s she was already called la madrina and, and it's not only because she was the godmother but it was because of other things in barrio antioquia she was the godmother to 200 kids the big twist of this episode the griselda character gets this revolutionary idea about how she's going to change the game in cocaine wholesale and retail and this is 1979 Miami. She says, I'm going to tap into a brand new market for cocaine sales. And that is rich gringos. Los blancos. Los ricos. Los malparidos esos que ya tienen todo. And I was sitting there going, well, who the hell were you selling to before, before that? <laughs> that? The whole market in the U.S. and in Europe is rich white people. I mean, that was who could afford, you had a product worth more than gold. If anybody had cocaine, they had to be an airline pilot. Real estate people down here. Doctor, attorneys. I had lawyers, I had doctors. Somebody that could afford what it cost. And who else made enough money to have that type of budget, to buy that product? Sure. You know, on a Friday, they were called weekend warriors since the 70s, since the early 70s. In this series, they keep going to a disco. Disco culture was fueled entirely, depending on what you were chasing, by cocaine or quaaludes, depending on what kind of night you wanted to have. Studio 54 was brown people and white people. 1977 was Studio 50, is when Studio 50, 54 blew up. Your mom was already working she in New York for a decade. There. Yeah, Hector Lavo used to party at my mother's penthouse that we was, you could overlook all Central Park. And sometimes he gets stuck there. <laughs> You've got Jimmy Buffett lyrics singing about cocaine. You've got Johnny Carson on The Tonight Show making cocaine jokes every night by 1976, 77. You've got the biggest movie stars in the world, the biggest musicians, the biggest athletes. They're all doing cocaine. From the 1970 disco scene and the Latin salsa scene also in, in the New York State and, you know, all the Puerto Ricans, all the Colombians, this this wave of migrants that come from Colombia are still used to the drugs that that Griselda provided in Medellin. Basuco, crystallized pure cocaine, you know, processed with ether from Peru and Bolivia. So they're used to living this life in their country, but now here they're in the big city and she was, her clientele was both white people and mostly brown people until the epidemic of bazooka of a bazooka became the crack epidemic and then it becomes the also the black american fast forward let's say to the 80s the cocaine cowboy days when a kilo cost 50k how many people can really afford that 50k only rich people unless you're a drug dealer <laughs> right you know an eight ball costs a thousand dollars two thousand dollars which you know the premise of this episode kind of has shows a fundamental lack of understanding of not only the history of of Uh, drug culture and cocaine trafficking, but also kind of a fundamental lack of understanding of like the role that Miami played in all of this. Because you were talking about transshipment points, right? You were talking about opening up uh, routes through the Bahamas, through Mexico, of course, Panama, Cuba. 
Miami was just one of those jumping off points. Because when your mom starts out in small doses, the mules, the brassiers, the underpants, like the quantities being moved, you could fly that shit right in to basically whatever your destination of choice was. L.A., Boston, New York, whatever it was. Of course, but yeah. now that you're trying to move weight because... Big weight. Well, the demand... Yeah, it was a, it, a blue. Right. Off the charts. You now need to move significant quantities and you now need these transshipment routes to keep it off the radar. Yeah. And Miami, which is America's Casablanca at that time, with the thousands of miles of, of unguarded... shoreline. Yeah, shoreline. And, you know, what's the line about... The great thing about Miami is it's so close to the United States. Miami was treated just like Panama, the Bahamas, Cuba, Mexico. It was like, oh, this is another transshipment point before we get to the U.S., right? Or so, to the major metropolitan areas. Right. And Miami also had its own market, obviously, for wholesale and retail. But, but it what, was the key... It was the key point where at least the Medellin drug cartel, New York as well, and then later California. But it was the key point that the transportation would boom everywhere. Right. So the East Coast, West Coast, the South, Chicago even. My mother t had Chicago on lock as well. But it wasn't just like this happened in 1979. No. It's out of no, oh, rich white people. And what is your mother's operation in Miami for real at that point? It started from... Hundreds of kilos, and then when she started implementing with export and import companies, it became containers. Then it was hundreds and thousands of kilos. By 1982, she's still the major distributor here in Miami, but she kind of lets my brothers to take over of all the distribution. And Cheeky becomes kind of like the number one distributor for Los Ochoas and everybody, Miami, and then we branch out to California. Chiqui is Osvaldo? Yeah, Osvaldo. So it's Dixon, Uber, Chiqui, and me. At the age of 19, he was considered the third largest cocaine distributor in the world. That was 1985. Why him, of the three brothers? He's the, uh, he's the youngest, basically, at that point, other than you. Gift. He was born with you. Remember RoboCop 2, the kid that gets killed in the, in, in the Brinks truck <laughs> yes. with all that money? Pay the man. All right. That was my brother. My brother was ahead of his time. He, he saw something, and he was a Miami boy, just like Uwir. We went to the UM games. My brother would hang out with blacks in the club, black American people. He had that foresight to not only sell to his own people, like most of the Medellin drug cartel, and he was an English-speaking kid raised in the States, not like in the Netflix thing. He's not that little kid. I was the little kid. He was already the prodigy of Los Ochoas and Pablo, and he was he was born, nació con mágicos, he was born with magicians, you get it? So he was very ahead of his time. How does that happen? How does your mother, I guess, see something the kid, in him? The kid had the gift. He was different. You know, I mean, here in Miami, they talk about, there was uh, five limousine companies at the time in, in Miami, and he owned three. And this is at the age of 17. He, he was, was an like, entrepreneur. Cheeky had that wisdom that like, why just Miami? We're, we're already heated up here. So let me branch out to Cali, leave Miami on the side, on the back burner, but let me see how much we can do in California. And, and that's what really made him that 100 millionaire by the time he was 19 years old. Before we get out to Cali, the Michael Corleone character in the series is born seemingly much later in the timeline than, than you are in real life. You're that's born correct. in- 1978, August 5th. Where? Medellin, Colombia. La Clinica Belén Rosales. So your mom is going back and forth between yes. Miami and, and Medellin yes. at that point? Was she ever concerned because she was a wanted woman in Colombia? Well, I guess she was a wanted woman in the U.S. too. She didn't give a shit, <laughs> she didn't give a shit about she, that either. My, they, that's why they call her La, La Chameleon. The Chameleon. Because she would hide in plain sight. So she goes... But she would put prosthetics on. She would put wigs. I mean, I remember to the year... To the year 2010, I had to buy her three wigs so she could hide a little while she was in Medellin. What is happening while you are a child, or a toddler? Like, you're, I imagine she's taking you back and forth with her when she's yes. traveling to... Yeah. My, mother, my mother never left without me or her boys. You know, yes, my brothers grew up real quick, so they started living alone at the age of 15. Here, when we lived on Key Biscayne, I... I could always see both my brother's penthouses from their penthouses. We were very united. So my mother wasn't the type that, oh, no, no. 
Buddy, we went on family fucking vacations every month together. If it wasn't Tahoe, if it wasn't um, upstate New York, the Hamptons, if it wasn't Orlando, it was always Disney something. World. You mean? Yeah, my mother was very family orientated, but we were a big family, you know. God rest their souls. We were we were real big. So when we would get together, it was um, it was a Griselda thing. It wasn't oh just us. It was twenty, thirty of us that she'd ship in from Medellin. That is true. I'll give that to them. That whole family aspect of 30 people in the fucking house, that, that's true. That's how my house was until shit hit the fan. Michael, what are your earliest memories of your mother? I would say one of the houses here where we had, when my father had a, the, the, the pet monkey, the house in Coconut Grove. Um, I'm sorry, pet monkey, did you? Yeah, my dad had a pet monkey beautiful freaking little monkey and a uh, monkey died somebody started shooting at a beehive beehive fell rushed everybody at the party you know they were all coked up for days probably <laughs> they hit the beehive beehive falls chases the monkey ch chases everybody there and everybody jumps into the pool three years old I, I never left my mother's side i remember living at that house and um Palm Island as well. I remember Palm yeah. Island. Let's talk about this. Where did because yeah. there's a lot of stories too about where we Griselda had the house lived. in Palm Island. We had the house in the Grove. My brothers later in, in later in the early '80s, uh, Key Biscayne is where we all relocated, and she held out Key Biscayne as her personal freaking compound, basically. Rivi in the Netflix show is an enforcer for Amilcar. You owe when he says. Which, of course, was not the case. Ruby came from, uh, Chicago. from Chicago, yeah. of course. Uh, met your mother down here in he South came Florida. He, he came from Corner Flaco from Chicago. He was working with Venegas, who I heard your, your mother may have known from Colombia as well. Mm -hmm. Which makes sense, because I don't know why she would have trusted Rivi, who was somewhat of Colombian, but a stranger to her, at least initially. Got him in the back of a car, and in the back seat was a lady. She asked me, she said, you're the one that fucked up the hit last night. And I said... In a way, I did. And, of course, there's this legendary story that Rivi tells about how he met your mother when he and Venegas fucked up a hit she was planning at the Yacaranda nightclub. You just talked about how you were sort of aware of the violence at a very young age and the presence of violence. When is it that you sort of came to understand that this was a dangerous trade and your mother may very well be a dangerous person? Earlier where, I say when we had to flee from Colombia, I, I understood that once again, oh, we're going back to Miami because something just happened here. And then I guess here would be during the second Cocaine Cowboy Wars with Rafiko. Everybody turned on her. Rafa, which was her best friend, flipped on her. They told her, whenever we see you, we are going after you. That's when the shit hit the fan with Rafa. And that's when Rivi and my brothers, there's a scene in my book that coming and seeing my brother Chiki and um, Rivi coming in through the door with, with las tulas full of weapons and bringing my brother Chiki a box and uh, telling everybody, I stand, I stand las mellizas, I stand las mellizas, there's the twins. Then bringing out 245 Colts that were engraved, chrome, and started playing with them. Kind of like that scene from Romeo and Juliet. We had been hiding out and keep his game for so many days without crossing that toll that I knew that, okay, we're reamping. It's you're, crazy. I, you're I, probably I, like five or six at the At the age that? of five, and I knew that. Uh -huh. At the age of five, I knew that, oh, we gotta kill this guy before he kills us. I set it up. We rent the houses, bought cars, weapons, automatic weapons, explosives, and I hate the streets. Rafa had put a million dollars on all of us, on all the three brothers, four mm -hmm. brothers. And my brother Chiki would tell me, he taught me how to load a weapon. I was four years old, going on five years old, and he'd tell me, hey, in case somebody is you, and you have to do this. This is how you lock and load. But nobody can come around you, so it's not like they're gonna try. But just so you know, there's people that want to take you away. So when my, I had that conversation with Chiki, remember Chiki was only nine years older than me. So I still, I was able to, he was able to converse to me on a level that was like, hey kid, what? You wanna know the truth? Yeah, you're kidnappable. So I knew that at a young age. This is bad shit, right? This is no kind of childhood. Yeah, yeah. Like I when mean, you're I, now, now that I'm old, older and I'm a 45 year old man with the family of himself I'm fully aware of the evil of drug trafficking a lot of people might be saying that I glorify it or I glorify the era and I'm guilty of that to a T 
but I understand now because of that life I've lived and the deaths I've seen and the people I've buried and that state of alarm that really never goes away, Billy. I understand how dangerous it is and the repercussions of getting that type of money through the drug trade. And it very nearly destroyed your yes. life. I mean, they say everybody in this trade winds up dead or in prison or both, you know, and, and you were on that path for a while. Yeah. I know we'll get was. into that later, but I mean, but, but I mean, you're talking about these experiences from when you're two, three, four, five, six years old, and this is monumentally fucked up. Like, yeah. I mean, you think about it through your, your own children's eyes. I always think about Wu-Tang. Life as a shorty shouldn't be so rough. Yeah. We're talking about Rivi and your mom meeting Rivi, how it's, I mean, completely different from what happens in the Netflix series. But did we get it right in Cocaine Cowboys? Is Rivi telling an accurate version of that story in the to, doc? With, I'd, I'd say 75 to 80% true. Okay. Yeah. No matter what, Rivi was a G. Let's talk about the early years with Rivi because he would have been around, right? In a time oh, yeah. that you were conscious. No, and, he and was memory. always around. Two gentlemen that were probably always around her was my father and my tío Paco, Paco Sepulveda. They were, Rivi respected them. Rivi knew that they were straight killers as well. And yeah, Rivi later on becomes, and I think you touched upon it on Cocaine Cowboys Reloaded, Rivi becomes more of Cheeky's killer. And the Marielitos are later Cheeky's killers. Was there a hit list? Rivi said he basically kept yes. a list of your mother's enemies, I guess Cheeky's enemies at some point yes. as well. The list was specifically the people that she wanted to get killed. All hits. You know, it's a very long list. And they had a, they had a price for each, each person. With a, with a dollar sign, with a yes. price, yeah, literally a price true. for their heads. Sometimes instead of paying them, if it was worth 50K, she'd give them a kilo. Just like she would give the kilos in Christmas to her nephews and to whoever was there, you know, just like that. Yeah, there was a hit list, and she 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 did that. It's of course the story goes that um, if you didn't pay her, you wound up on the hit list. If she owed you money, you'd wind up on the hit list. You got killed one way or another. She was notorious for not honoring just debts. Is that accurate? No, um, my mother was good business. And she would always tell me, no se falton con la gente. Don't, um, you don't need to con people out of their money. Don't, you know, don't, if you give them your word, say, when I paga, be good payment. She always said that. We'll, we'll get to this eventually, but she was so good at business, she wouldn't light thousands of kilos on no, fire in I an empty pool. All right, hang on, spoiler alert, spoiler <laughs> alert. What are your earliest memories of Miami? Like, where did you go? Where did you hang out? Did you go to parks? Did you go to restaurants? Restaurants. I mean, back then, my father, would he was constantly eating. He gained a shitload of weight. He got real big. <laughs> They're rich. We always ate at the Rusty Pelican. Because you're on Key Biscayne. Yeah, because we're on Key Biscayne. Right. My dad would take me back then in the 80s. Tony Rome was, was real good. It was <laughs> like the drug dealer thing to go to and eat your ribs. The Omni Theater had a movie theater. Right. I remember it. Being in Key Biscayne and, you know, the fear of the whole war with Rafa and uh, telling my mother, I want to go see this movie. And it was the never ending story. And I remember out of nowhere, my mother just snapping on everybody, like telling everybody, what, do you, what are we doing here? Like, if we're scared, don't forget who we are. And she, I remember her telling Rivi and my brother Chiki, we're taking that little fucker to go to the movies tonight, no matter what. And I remember leaving in the white limo. I remember the, the Land Cruiser and the motorcycles on the side. I remember sitting down and being so happy is the never ending story, looking to my left and seeing my mother looking like, like a drug baroness, I'm not gonna lie, with all her diamonds on. And I remember looking at her diamond necklace and then looking up to my left and right next to her was Guillermo Velasquez, which was our personal bodyguard. He bodyguarded me into the year 2000 as well. He was one of the pistoleros from Cocaine Cowboys. You put him in your documentary. They were mainly enforcers slash hitmen. Miguelito, Rivi, and Chiquis Marielitos, my brother Dixon and Uwer, and looking around and there was nobody else. There was not one other person in that theater. She had rented out the whole theater just for us. And I remember thinking to myself, we must be important. And I got my way. 
and I always remember that. She was very spoiled. She would spoil me a lot. Rivy would like, or these guys would yes. be around for my personal family. Rivy was always with us in the in Key Biscayne. He was always in the penthouse with us. You know, he was always around Cheeky, and Rivy wasn't dumb. He understood that Cheeky was taking over, and that this kid was the future of of the Blanco family. Michael, how aware was your mom? You you might have been too young, but about the cat and mouse game. The DEA had been on to her she since New York her. in 74, 75. The local police, particularly the Metro Dade Police Department, Miami Police Department, was on to her hot and heavy since starting in about 78 when she was on their radar, but then 79. certainly by the Dadeland Crown Liquors shooting, which we'll get into in, in a future episode. That's why we chose to relocate to California. And, she, and my brothers were already dabbling over there. It got too hot. Just too much police and a lot of heat on, the, on TV. So I talked to Rochelle, I said, you know, it's, this is getting real hot here. Let's take a vacation somewhere. She said, yeah, you know, we're thinking about moving the operations to California. But, I remember. But that was years later, though. I mean, like, because Sentac was formed, I mean, 80, went fully operational December 81, thereabouts. About that time. But, like, you weren't out in Cali for, I mean, she wasn't until for another couple of years. No, we that. were still already going there, visiting, migrating, and she was setting stuff up. Okay. We had people from Medellin that were already living in LA, Beverly Hills and in the Bay Area as well. So she basically, she had the foresight, but it was really more cheeky speaking with the Dons in Medellin and seeing like, okay, if we go to California, cause Miami's so hot, if we calm it down, yeah, well then we want distribution out here as well. She was so aware that we always kept a suitcase ready to go, I'll give them that too. A Netflix series, I'll give him that. Um, that's completely true. There was always the suitcases ready to go, and we were alarmed, and then within two minutes, we were ready to go. She was so aware that we had multiple stash houses through all Miami, West Palm Beach, Fort Lauderdale. That, too, is true that they put in it. She was always um, alert. I guess when you've done so much in your life, you when you've seen so much, you're always aware Coming up in the next episode is Rafa, the Achoas, uh, playing a much more prominent role in the Netflix series. Max Mermelstein. Max. Uh, of, of course, your your boy, your boy Max. Uh, <laughs> and, um, and we'll talk, we'll have a conversation we've never had publicly before about the Cocaine Cowboys documentaries, about what we got right, what we got wrong. I want to ask you about your, your mother's reaction to uh to the documentaries uh which should be an interesting uh conversation uh as well uh, and we'll talk about how if you get in trouble in the bay area well if you get in trouble in the bay area ace deuce will bust you loose Ace Deuce will bust you loose.